Praise the Lord. We rise up as we pray together to prepare ourselves for the study tonight. You want to close your eyes and talk to the Lord, that the Lord will speak to your heart tonight as we come to this Bible study. Open your mouth and pray that today the word of the Lord will refresh your soul and the Lord himself will inject into your spirit the things you need to know and the things that will do you good in time and throughout eternity. That God will give you the heart to honor, to reverence, to respect, to love, to fear the Lord. That you account the word of God, not as the word of man, but as the word of the Lord indeed. Pray that this word, like water, will wash and cleanse and purge and purify you, make you white as snow. Touch you in the inner man. Transform your spirit. And make you the kind of believer that the Lord Jesus Christ wants to see. As a fruit, as a result of his death on the cross of Calvary. Pray that the Lord himself, through the word, will convert you, transform you, lift you up to a higher realm, greater height, and give you the heart and the life that will honor the Lord, glorify the Lord, that all those who see the word of God walking out in your life will bring glory unto the Lord. And pray that the word will make you a true disciple. If he continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And it's not only the hearers of the word who are justified, but the doers of the word. Pray that you'll not be a stranger in the house of God. Only coming but not part of the family of God. Pray that you'll not have a strange heart. A strange attitude. You'll not have a stranger's disposition in the family. But you'll have the heart of a son, the heart of a daughter. Listening to the word of God and taking in the word of the Father. That word working effectively, effectually in your heart. Controlling everything you do. Out there in the world, guiding your footsteps, guiding your decisions, moderating your life, enriching other people, and defining the church through your life. Pray that tonight will be another night the Lord will open your eyes to see wondrous things out of His Word. And what you see, what you learn, what you receive will help you to glorify God more, to serve the Lord more acceptably with reverence and godly fear will help you to prepare for eternity that God will make this place where you are the gateway to heaven, preparing you for that wonderful, glorious, eternal city.
Let there be a willingness to learn and a willingness to do. As the Lord says that your life will be directed and controlled, influenced by thus says the Lord. And that you'll be among those people that tremble at his word, having a contrite heart, a humble heart, humble spirit, that will willingly, cheerfully, faithfully, loyally, obediently carry on and carry through the word that he teaches. And pray that you'll not be a forgetful hearer, always hearing, always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Pray that you'll not be dull of hearing. By that time, you ought to be teachers of the word yourself. You seem to be like babes that still have need of the milk rather than of the meat of the world. Pray that you come to maturity, adulthood. In the fold, in the flock, among the people of God. And pray that God will use what you hear, what you learn, To make you a real child of the kingdom. That you'll not be a backslider right in the midst of the people of God. That you'll not be like Pharaoh with a hardened heart who became a reprobate. As a young person, what a privilege you have, like Samuel, to hear the word of the Lord and to have your life directed, controlled, shaped by the word, the word of the Lord. Don't cast away this great pearl of great price. Appreciate it. Receive it. Hold it fast. Forsake it not. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for bringing us together tonight. We thank you because it's always a joyful thing and a great privilege to be in your presence, to learn your word with other children of God and the family of God. Lord, we pray that tonight, as your word comes out, it will enrich every heart, every soul, and turn our spirits around towards you in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that this, this war like fire will burn every chaff out of our lives in Jesus' name. Like water will wash and cleanse and purge and purify us and transform us and make us whiter than snow in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray the defilement of the human nature, the pride of the depravity of the fallen man, that today your word will come like a sword and cut everything away from us in Jesus' name. That this word like hammer will break and and shatter all the rocky hearts in Jesus' name. That, Lord, the, that kind of pride that comes in your presence and will not bow and bend and be contrite and be humble before you. We pray that the hammer of the word will shatter everything tonight in Jesus' name. 
Take hold of us and turn us in the right direction tonight. Because the kind of children you love to have in your presence, that our lives will bring glory and honor adoration unto you. We pray, Lord, that tonight you'll be glorified as we look at the word, as we study the word, as we learn the word, and as we pray to have your grace to obey in our hearts in Jesus' name. Let your spirit come along with the word. That, Lord, the Spirit of God will give us conviction and then give us consecration. That, Lord, our lives will be fully surrendered, submitted unto you. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can see now. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4. We've been studying Daniel, and uh, this uh, Daniel chapter 4 has quite a lot for every one of us. And the study tonight concerns everyone. It's a place many people have been. And there are many people that are still in such a place tonight, all over the world. And if there is any problem, if there is anything that shows the depravity of man, the fallen nature of man, the, the kind of heart that people have that God says... That is a reprobate. It is what we find in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, which the Lord eventually dealt with. And when the Lord dealt with him, and the Lord took the sword of the Spirit, and also the rod of judgment, and applied both the instruction as well as the indignation upon Nebuchadnezzar, by the grace of God, eventually Nebuchadnezzar realized, and he submitted himself unto the Lord. And this mark, evidence of depravity in him, the Lord cut it off, and he himself was able to to testify that now I give glory to God. I honor the Lord because the great problem of the fallen man that affects the whole of mankind that I had before, everything now is gone. And the reason we're studying it is so that we'll allow the same oppression of grace and the same power of the Spirit and the same influence of the Holy Spirit that came upon him and made such a change and such a transformation that we will allow the Lord tonight that he'll do that same work of grace in us and it's the power of his Spirit will work with the Scriptures in our heart effectually, effectively in Jesus' name. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 37. Daniel chapter 4 verse 37. Now I, Daniel, sorry, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, tell me the rest, is able to abase. They that walk in pride, those who walk in pride, is able to to our base. By the way, you want to understand that Nebuchadnezzar just told us now a timeless truth. An eternal truth. A statement that is true from generation to generation. A statement you cannot even modify. You cannot say that was true at that time and that is no more true today. Why do we say that? We're looking at Matthew chapter 23 and we're looking at verse 12. Matthew chapter 23 verse 12. A new server shall exalt himself, shall be what? Abase, exactly the words that uh, Nebuchadnezzar used that day, that walk in pride, is able to abase. And here comes the Lord Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. And then he tells us that everyone, whosoever, whosoever you may be, no matter his position in the world, or no matter his knowledge, no matter his privilege, no matter his usefulness in the world. He says, whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. And that's what Jesus Christ said. And that is still true today. And the Lord is teaching us this from the life of Nebuchadnezzar because after the Lord had brought the judgment, the indignation, the wrath, the chastisement, the divine discipline upon Nebuchadnezzar, he learned this one solitary single important lesson. 
that we, we must not be proud in our lives, in our hearts, because those who walk in pride is able and you will abase. We're looking at Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 18. Daniel chapter 5. We're looking at verse 18. O thou king, the most high God, give Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he slew. And whom he would, he kept alive. And whom he would, he set up. And whom he would, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his mind had it in pride. You see that his heart was lifted up because of his wealth, his riches, and because of his kingdom, because of his power, and because of his dominion, because of his authority, and because of the people that he had dominion over. It says his heart was lifted up. And his mind had inch in pride. He was deposed from his kingly throne. And they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men. And his heart was made like the beasts. And his dwelling was with the wild asses. And they fed him with the grass like oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God ruled, ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over each whomsoever he will. That's the lesson he eventually learned. But before he learned that, the Lord showed him how God, the God of heaven, is against pride. In any shape and any form, in anyone, at any time, in any nation, in any generation. He learned the lesson eventually, but that was at a later time in his life when he learned the lesson that he should have learned earlier in life. He had received revelations of the collapse of human kingdoms. That's in chapter 2. And the replacement of superior empires with inferior powers. He learned that in chapter 2 from the interpretation of Daniel. And the importance of pagan religion. Yet his pride remained untouched. How many people have learned many great lessons and they have had great revelations and they have read the inspired word of God over and over like Nebuchadnezzar had the opportunity to learn from Daniel and yet their pride still remains intact and their haughtiness still remains untouched. And their lives to remain untransformed. He had seen the great manifestations of the presence of God and the power of the Almighty. And he had been warned by God's heavenly and earthly messengers, both prophets and angels, who warned him a watcher from heaven, speaking to him that judgment was coming. But he was still full of pride until a great unprecedented punishment came from heaven upon him. Nebuchadnezzar's pride was inherent in his nature. He liked independence and he acted independently of any superior authority. And that's, the, and that's why people are proud. If you are proud, that's the reason you are proud. You want to be independent of any superior authority. Nobody above you. You don't recognize anyone that has any word to say. Anything to say. You are the all in all. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, his empire, his success, his vast dominion, and the privilege or the prestige of conquest made his heart to be lifted up and his mind to be high in pride, boasting of his vast dominion. He, he, he was proud of his wisdom. He was proud of his power. He was proud of his accomplishment, wrapped in the thoughts of his greatness. He was forgetful of God and he was independent of his creator. When people have achieved a little success, when they have had a little things to gather together of the sand and the mud and able to build what they call the mansion. Not understanding that all that is just sand 
and mud. And when they are able to collect some things together and some parts of the wood of the forest, they have cut in pieces and made some of this furniture that looks very, very nice. Not to understand everything is dug from the ground. And then they become so pompous and so proud as if they have the whole of the world. That was the case of Nebuchadnezzar. And then his judgment gives us a very solemn warning against pride and being glory. With all his ability, he had nothing which he had not received from God. And think about it, the clothes you wear, you didn't manufacture that. The wool from that one, where that came from, and everything you have, everything you can lay hand upon, the books you read, the knowledge you have, the skill you have, the experience you have, the success you have, everything comes from God. There is nothing to be proud of. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter four verse seven. First Corinthians chapter four verse seven. Who makes thee to differ from another? What are you proud about? What are you haughty, pompous about? What's lifting you up? What's making your head, your mind to swell up? Why are you, why are you having been glory? What have you got that has not been given to you? For what? Who makest thee to differ from another? Or what, and what hast thou that has, that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou hast received it, why dost thou glory? As if Thou hast not received it. And that was the problem of Nebuchadnezzar. He was thoughtless. He wasn't thinking. Uh, do you ever think in your life, and uh, you look at your life while the devil is whispering to you, how great you are, how wonderful you are, how beautiful, how handsome you are, how rich, how wealthy you are, how popular you are. Have you ever thought about it, that everything you have to the minutest detail? was given to you by the almighty God and now you are forgetful of that God you are independent of that God what have you got that has not been given to you and if you are misusing that which has been given to you as if independently you have acquired it yourself what arrogance is that what pride is that what haughtiness is that whoever plumes himself that will plume and that's like you know you put on the feathers of a peacock and then you become so proud. And then you clothe yourself with kinds of colorful feathers. And then you think, I'm the, I'm the king of the birds. I'm the, I'm the highest, I'm the most beautiful, whoever, whosoever, plumes himself upon what he has done in the world. As if he were the author of it all. And not simply an instrument in the hand of God. He's really as proud and haughty as Nebuchadnezzar was. The businessman who speaks of his business as a sole result of his ability. Or the, or the rich man who calls himself with supreme satisfaction the architect of his own fortunes. Or the professional who thinks of his accomplishment as the creation of his own genius. Or the successful man who looks upon his position as entirely self-made. All alike are guilty of Nebuchadnezzar's sin. For they have shot God out of their hearts. And they have not given him the honor, the glory to which uh, he is entitled. Let us be closed with humility. And wherever we are, and whatever we have, let us acknowledge God and submit under his authority. In fact, uh, Isaiah chapter 10 verse 15 tells us, you have nothing to be proud of. Nothing to be proud of. And it gives us a pertinent, practical, important illustration in uh, Isaiah chapter 10 verse 15. Isaiah 10. I'm reading from verse 15. Shall the axe boast itself against him that he was there with? It's saying, here is an axe. And the axe is saying, I am sharp. I am solid. I'm effective. Well, the axe boast itself against him that he was there with. What if the man did not lift up the axe? What if the hand of man did not touch and lift up and use the axe? What will the axe do by itself? 
What if the hand of the Almighty God has not taken hold of you to make use of you and to put you in a place of responsibility? What would you be in life? And then it goes on in that verse 15. Or shall the soul magnify itself against him that shaketh it? What can the soul do? And what can the soul cut? If there is no hand that is shaking or moving that saw, that's what he's saying. And then it says, as if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up, or as if the staff should lift up itself, as if it were no wood. He's saying you're still ordinary wood, you're still ordinary human being. And if you accomplish anything in life at all, it's because of what God decides to do. And he's telling us, be humble. There's nothing to be proud of. Against your neighbor or against the Almighty God, because everything you know, everything you have, everything you can do, every place you find yourself, every success you achieve, everything is coming from the Almighty God, and there's nothing you could have done by yourself without the divine help. We're looking at this study tonight, divided into three parts. Number one, the perception and personification of pride. Perception, to understand what pride is. When pride is being manifested, not judging other people, looking at yourself. Looking at the mirror of the word of God tonight and say, I see myself. I see my face in the mirror. I see my heart. I see my attitude. I see my disposition. Looking at yourself, not judging other people. The perception and the personification of pride. Number two, the punishment and the perdition of the proud. The punishment and the perdition of the proud. And then number three, to avoid eternal punishment, which, by the way, Nebuchadnezzar avoided. He escaped eternal punishment. He escaped that endless, eternal, everlasting wrath of God because there was a change here on earth. And that's why I was studying. That's why I was studying. If we only study, and the study benefits us only in this world, we are most men, most miserable, of all men, most miserable. The reason we study is so that we'll be able to escape the judgment of God, and then there must be purging and preservation from pride. If we're going to enjoy eternal fellowship with the Almighty God, point number three, then the purging. And preservation from pride. Point number one. The perception and personification of pride. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 28. Daniel chapter 4 verse 28. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. Then... King, the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon? Stop there for a moment. Uh, generally, if you are poor, sometimes you have, you have nothing to be proud of. You are a poor man. You have nothing to put on. You have nothing to eat. You have no shelter. You have no house. You have no certificate. You have no children. You have, you have nothing. Uh, like Lazarus, you are humble. And then you're depending upon other people. Can you let me this? Can you give me this? Can you help me? And uh, almost a beggar. Nothing to be proud of. But it's when, when God has given you the chance, the opportunity to be somewhere. The opportunity to be something. And God takes a nobody and makes him a somebody. And God could have taken another person there because it says that God rules in the kingdom of man and he appointed whomsoever he will. He could have appointed another person. In fact, he says he appoints the basest of men. The basest of men. The basest of men. Without, uh, you know, going into any kind of politics, you understand? Look at all the countries. All the countries of the world. From the greatest to the smallest. It's not, the, it's not the most scientific mind that is the president of a country. And it is not the most mathematical mind that is the president of any country. And it's not the most knowledgeable in technology that is the president of any country. God chooses anybody. And if you are there today, like a Nebuchadnezzar, understand, it's not because of what you know, it's not because of what you have. He appointed whomsoever he will. And then he puts him there, even the basest of men. 
And if Nebuchadnezzar had only known that and had said, I'm grateful for what I have. I'm not, I do not merit it. I'm grateful for the position I hold. I do not merit it. And if he was not grateful, that's why he came to the problem he came to. Now look at yourself now today. And see what you have. And see what you do. And then think, couldn't God have found a better person like you? Of course. A more knowledgeable person than you are. Of course. Couldn't God have found a more spiritual person than you are? Of course. And then put him there. Whatever privilege you have in the house of God or in society, in the world, anywhere. Couldn't God have found another person to replace you? Yes, he could. That should make you humble. That's what Nebuchadnezzar was not thinking about. He was thinking about his greatness and his height and his loftiness and what he had. It says... The king spake and said, It's not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. That's the thing that came out of his mouth, and that was the pride. He himself recognized that later as pride. Hey, look at chapter verse four, verse thirty-seven. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven, all whose works are truth, his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to. Abyss. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. And let us see the perception, the perception and the personification of pride. Isaiah chapter 14. We're looking at it from verse 13. Isaiah 14 verse 13. Here we're told in the word of the Lord. It says, for thou hast said, where? In thine heart, understand? You may not even talk at all. You may not even open your mouth and say anything. In thine heart. And God, God recognizes it there. And God knows it there. And that was said, in thine heart. What did he say? Is that I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will seek also upon the mount of the congregation, in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like, like who? The most high. He was a created being. And God gave him a good position. But that wasn't enough. In his heart, can you imagine somebody who is envious of God, the creator? Can you imagine somebody who is envious of the Almighty, the Most High? And he said, I will be like the Most High. Can you imagine what son is envious of the Father? Can you imagine what student is envious of the Professor? Can you imagine what employee is envious of the employer? A creature envious of the Creator. And by the way, when it says, in his heart, that's where pride sits. You look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 8, and we're looking at verse 2. It says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God, God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to pro- and to prove thee and to know what was where in thine heart whether ye would keep his commandments or no. And that's the interest of God. It's not just looking at the words we speak. It's not just looking at the dress we put on. It's not just looking at the things we build around ourselves. It's looking at in thine heart because that is where the pride actually originates in verse 17 of that determined chapter 8 verse 17 and thou shalt say in thine heart my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth in thine heart 
You may, you may be so shy, you don't say to people, and you may think that uh, people will kind of say about us pride if you say to them, but in your heart, every time you are going around, when you look at another person, you look at that person, you size him up, and then in your heart, I'm higher than this, I'm greater than this, I'm, I'm holier than this, I'm more important than this, I'm more significant than this. The work I'm doing is more important, more significant than this one in your heart. You may not say it out. You may not even wear something flamboyant. Your clothes may not be flamboyant and your look may not be flamboyant. You might be able to kind of condition yourself and people think you're humble. You might be bending to everybody whenever you are. You see them. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. But in your heart, in your heart, in thine heart, my power, my might, my education, my experience, my expertise, my skill, my ability has gotten this for me. That's the pride. It's in the heart. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 4. In thine heart, in thine heart, chapter 9 verse 4, it says, speak not thou in thine heart. No, don't even tell you in the privacy of your room, where you are, all alone by yourself, in the thoughts, in your inner man. Don't even say that because there's pride. It says, speak not thou in thine heart, after that, the Lord thy God has cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord does drive them out from before thee. It says, don't even say that in your heart. I'm better than this. You, you know the story of the children of Israel. As you look at the children of Israel, and then you look at the Egyptians. Are they better? No, they are not better. And you look at the Canaanites. Look at all the idolatry that all the Canaanites went into. And when eventually Israel got into the land of Canaan, didn't they worship the same idol? They did. And so the Lord is saying, don't ever say in your heart, I'm better than the Canaanites. I'm better than the Amalekites. That's why the Lord has brought me in. And that's why the Lord has destroyed them. He says, no, this is grace. This is my mercy. This is my gift because of my covenant with Abraham. Don't ever say in your heart, I am where I am because of what I know I can do and what I have got. Don't say it in your heart because that will be pride. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 47. Isaiah chapter 47 in thine heart. 47 verse 8. Isaiah chapter 47 verse 8. Therefore, hear now this. Thou that are given to pleasures, that dwellest carelessly, that seest in thine heart. The Lord is always looking at how to say in your heart. How you carry yourself. What you think about yourself. And that's why you trample on other people. That's why you push other people down. That's why you have no regard, no respect for other people. Because of what you say in your heart, yourself. That's why you look down, belittle, minimize, commonize other people. Who is this and hand of all people talking to me like that because of what you say to yourself in your heart. And that's where pride begins. The perception and the personification of pride that the Lord is saying what you tell yourself in your heart and that's where it began with Nebuchadnezzar then it came out after 12 months it wasn't that they began to think about that he had been telling himself in his heart I am and who else is available here who else can, uh, can uh, do anything over here because I am and there's nobody else that can compete with me. So the Lord said, therefore hear this now. Thou, uh, thou that art given to pleasures, that dwellest carelessly, that seest in thine heart, I am and none else beside me. I shall not see it as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. Verse 10, for thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, none seeth me, thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath, per it hath perverted thee, and thou hast said in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me. That's the problem in thine heart. Where that thing appears. We're looking at Obadiah. Obadiah has only one chapter. We're looking at verse 3. Obadiah, verse 3. 
the pride of thine heart. You see, it's in the heart. The pride of thine heart has deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart. He says it in his heart. And what does he say? Who shall bring me down to the ground? That's a very dangerous thing. You know, look up here, brothers and sisters. Have you heard about, uh, you know, the, in the politics of our land? And they say that the immunity of the the swine leadership, the president and the governor and all the other, the senators and everyone. And if you keep the immunity there, what that means is that while you are there, the law can never catch you. You are not under any control of anybody. You are above the law. And when you say in your heart, I am here, I am here. I am the leader here. I am so and so here. I am such and such here. And I carry immunity. That means I carry a such protection. My office, my position grants me that protection. And nobody dare touch me. Now in the church, we don't have any immunity like that. But you might think in yourself, if they dare touch me, the whole church will rise up and this church will scatter. And this church will riot. They have never seen riot in this church before. But if they ever dare to touch me, and they try to correct me and say, no, you are not to be there. You are to be here. I'm telling you the position I have, the popularity I have, the prestige I have. If they dare touch me, this whole church will scatter. And they don't want the church to scatter. So whatever I do, they just leave me alone because I say in my heart, I am and there is none else. That's a very dangerous position for you because God has 1,001 ways to be able to bring that proud heart down. Let me show you again, Obanah verse 3. The pride of thine heart has deceived thee that thou dwellest in the clefts of the rock whose habitation is high that says in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? And that was the perception. That's the perception of pride. And Obadiah said, this is terrible. It's the manifestation of pride. What's pride? It is the contemplation of self. What's pride? It is the having self on the throne of our being. What's pride? It is concentration in self as the one object of attention, of observation, of consideration, always everywhere in all things. Pride feels man's nature with self-complacency, with self-admiration, and with self-satisfaction. The poor may be proud, and the rich can also be proud. Self-admiration is, is at the root of pride. Self-absorption. Always thinking about yourself. You're not thinking about God, about your neighbor, about the qualities of other people, about the help of other people, about the contribution of other people to what we're doing. Only yourself. You are the center of gravity for everything. That's pride. Self-absorption is the result of pride. Self-adoration also stems from pride. Pride lifts up a man in his own esteem that he becomes the only one object of importance, of interest, of devotion. He knows no superior to respect. Those who are proud, uh, they, even the air around them, they look to the way they look at people and the way they regard people. There is nobody to respect or regard and no one inferior to regard. They don't, they don't look at anybody. They just know that, you know, I'm there. If you are lucky to be around me, you are just lucky. But I am the center of attraction. And, you know, he knows, he knows nobody that is superior to him. And no sooner he self made an idol than it shuts the windows of the inner being again. Against God above and against man below. Pride drives men away from God. What does he need God for? What did Nebuchadnezzar need God for? 
Nothing. He had the money, he had the wealth, he had the people, he had the governors, he had the captains, he had all the people around him. He had all the food he wanted to eat, and he had all the army, and he had all the instruments of war. And what did he need God for? Pride was shut out God from the presence of anyone. Dreaming of independence, pride, placing self where God ought to be, and refusing to recognize any being above or below, external to it. That is a great and your sin in the sight of God. In many passages of scripture, we have a full length portrait of the proud drawn by the unerring words of truth. Pride renders God a disagreeable object of worship to the sinner. Pride consists in an unduly exalted opinion of oneself. It is therefore impatient of a rival. He hates a superior and cannot endure a master. Pride hates anybody that is superior to him because he feels that that person that is superior to him he should not be there he's a usurper he actually should be there that's what pride sings pride sings all those people above me how did they get there by the way anybody trying to control me or direct me anybody trying to be my master trying to say do it this way and do it this way how did he get there? Because he feels the greatest in the universe. And nobody should be giving him or should be calling a shot at his life. And so that that's what pride does. It prevents sinners from seeking the true knowledge of God and then making them unwilling to be taught. Pride makes the proud to feel self-sufficient. And that's a great hindrance to many wise men after the flesh. And that's why we're told in Psalm 10 verse 4. Let's look at Psalm 10 verse 4. And see this effect of pride in the life of anyone. In Psalm 10 verse 4. The wicked through, his, through the pride of his countenance. The wicked because of his pride. Here is what it says. Will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. The rich, what are they praying for? They have all the money they want. Those who are healthy and strong, those athletes, what do they need God for? They are practiced and they have all the strength. And they know that they are going to break the record. And then the scientists, what do they know? They think it's all evolution. And this uh, atom and this other one colliding together for all those ages. And then eventually an ape came and eventually a human being came. In, in fact, they even want to start now to see whether they can create a human being and put some things together and let inanimate objects produce life and then they can say hey look at it we're also like god we're able to create that's what human beings are and because of the pride of their heart there's no thought of god in their mind i pray god will deliver us in Ezekiel chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 17. Ezekiel chapter 28, and we're reading from verse 17. In verse 17, thine heart was lifted up. It, it's the problem of the heart. Pride starts from the heart. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy Thy, thy wisdom by reason of the bright of thy brightness i will cast thee down to the ground i will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee you see it's starting from the heart i told you when we read i said chapter 14 the creature a cry, trying to envy the creator the child trying to envy the father and the human being trying to envy even the angels of god in second samuel chapter 15 second samuel chapter 15 we're looking at verse 4 second samuel chapter 15 verse 4 and absalom said moreover oh that i were made judge in the land that every man which has any suit or cause might come unto me and i will do him justice he was envious of his father 
And he's a father that had that mercy on him. He was actually a criminal. He was a murderer. And then he went into exile. And Joah pleaded for him. You must know the story. And eventually he came back. And eventually his father was merciful and received him graciously. And now he was say at the court while, while David would be inside and would be sitting there on the throne. And those who have anything will be coming to him. As uh, those people were coming, he'll accost them. He'll say, stop. Where are you going? I want to go and see the king. What do you want to see him for? This is my problem. This is my problem. Oh, if I were the deputy to the king, I'll do you justice. But you know the king, the king feels that he knows everything. He doesn't have any assistant. He doesn't have any deputy. But oh, if I were made a judge in the land, envy, but because of pride, he forgot he should have died. And if for God, it should have been judged. If for God, if they had followed the law of God, given by Moses from a Genesis uh, to, uh, sorry, from Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, he would have been stone dead because of what he did. But he forgot the mercy of God. And now he began to scheme. Look at verse 5. And it was so that when any man came near to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and he took him and he kissed him. And on this manner did, Abs did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So as Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Is it, you're not talking about stealing money. If this is even more serious than stealing money, if the people that steal money, if they are judged and disciplined and gotten out of the place, how about the people that steal the hearts of the people? They steal their hearts away from God. The people will honor them more than they honor God. The people will obey them more than they obey God. The people will fear them more than we fear Jesus, more than we fear the Lord. Stealing the minds and the hearts of the people away from the Lord. And it was pride that got me into this. We're looking at verse 10. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as she hear the sound of the trumpet, then he shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And with Absalom went two hundred men out of Jerusalem that were called, and they went in their simplicity and they knew not anything those people were thoughtless people themselves they knew not they knew nothing about it they didn't know the heart they didn't know his purpose they didn't know his desire they didn't know his goal they didn't know his dream they didn't know his ambition and because they didn't know in their simplicity, they just followed sheepishly. I pray God will deliver us in Jesus' name. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 50 verses 31 and 32. Jeremiah chapter 50. And we're looking at verse 31 and verse 32. Chapter 50 verse 31. Behold, I am against thee, thou most proud. Behold, I'm against thee, O thou most proud, says the Lord God of hosts, for thy, for thy day is come, the time that I will visit thee, and the most proud shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise him up. And I will kindle a fire in the cities, and it shall devour all around him. We'll come to point number two, the punishment and the perdition of the proud. The punishment and the perdition of the proud. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. We're reading from verse 28. Daniel chapter 4, verse 28 to verse 33. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth. 
There fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee eat grass, a salt sin, and seven times seven years shall pass over thee until thou know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth thee to whomsoever he will wheel the same hour was a thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till the, his ears were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's Clause. That's the punishment that came upon him. Look at verse 37. He realized later that that was punishment. The abasement. That was punishment. It says now, I Nebuchadnezzar praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. All whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, what's God able to do? Is able to abase them. Is able to abase. In Daniel chapter 5 verse 20. Daniel chapter 5 verse 20. And when his heart was lifted up. And his mind hardened in pride. Do you know that pride hardens people? If somebody is really proud. And then an angel may even come to speak to him from heaven. If the pride is there. And the pride is not touched. And the pride is not, the proud heart is not softened. That, that's what had in his heart. Whatever he hears, whatever he sees, he'll say, I don't believe that. God can give him a dream or vision or a direct teaching like this. We'll come to the Bible study and the Lord teaches us everything. If the person can hear every syllable and every word and every sentence and everything that is said, and he still say, whatever they say, I have my goal. I have my plans. I have my objective. And I'm still going to achieve what I want to achieve until God deals with such such a man, such a woman, such a boy, and such a girl, such a youth. Because pride hardens the heart and doesn't allow people to submit themselves before the Lord. It says his heart was lifted up and his mind was hardened in pride. He was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. In verse 21, and he was driven from the sons of men and his heart was made like the beasts and the dwelling and his dwelling was what the wild asses they fed him with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the most high god ruled in the kingdom of men and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will whomsoever he will What's that telling us? It's saying that in the mind of God, it's not, listen to this, it's not democracy. That's why you don't vote for leaders in the church. That's why you don't say, now, who is going to be the overseer in this state? Let us vote. No, he appointed whomsoever he will. Who is going to take care in this district or in this, uh, in this group or in this region? Let's vote. No. That God is the one that ruleth over all. And it says, he appointed over it whomsoever he will. And you know, when God has done that, there are times that somebody will say, in his own heart, this one of all people that they put there to be our overseer. This one of all people they put there to be our leader. I am better than him. I know when he was converted. I know when he came to this church. I was the one doing the follow-up. I know when I taught him the basic fundamental doctrines of the Bible. And here it is. Now look at, the, look at this kind of system. And they put this man there. I am better. How do you know you are better? How do you know you are better? Is it the knowledge of the head? You are higher than God. You see more than God. You know more than God. And you know who ought to be there. You ought to be there. God has made a mistake. You should have been there. He should not have been there. It says over here that God ruled in the kingdom of men. And that he appointed over that kingdom whomsoever he will. And thou his son, Belshazzar, that hast not humbled thine heart, though 
thou knewest all this. You knew all this, but you had in yourself. And then you went to take the vessels of the house of the Lord and then to be drinking wine with that. You had in yourself in pride. What's the consequence of that? Proverbs chapter 8, 16. In Proverbs chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 18. Proverbs chapter 16. We're looking at verse 18. Pride goes before what? Before destruction. And, and haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be an humble spirit. To be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil of the proud. It's telling us there there's punishment for those who are proud. In Second Chronicles chapter 26. Second Chronicles chapter 26. We're reading from verse 16. Second Chronicles chapter 26. And we're reading from verse 16. It says, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. When he was strong. When he was a child, a babe. A newcomer, when he was just a house fellowship leader, and when he was just weak, when he had nothing, he had no job, when we were all helping him in the district, have this, have this, that time he was humble. But now when he became strong, it says it was when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God, and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of he says, what's that? He was a king. And then the priests had their duty and responsibility. And eventually, he became so proud and lifted up, he felt his royal assignment was not enough. And he must now take what, peop- what he has not been given. These are pertaining to the priests of God, but I can do it too. What do they know that I don't know? What do they have that I don't have? They carry that sense of incense with their hand. I've hands to you. And then they walk to the place with their feet. I have feet to you. And this is what they say when they offer the incense. I can say that to you. I know what they know. I can do what they can do. That's the pride. Stay where God has put you. And do not usurp another person's, another, another leader's responsibility. Over here we're told about this man. And then in verse 17, and Azariah the priest went in after him. And, and with him four score, that's 80 priests of the Lord, that were valiant men. And they were to Uzziah the king and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto the Uzziah to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests of the, the sons of Aaron that are consecrated to burn incense, go out of the sanctuary. For thou hast trespassed, neither shall lead be for thine honor for the, from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was wroth. He was angry. The people like that, they cannot bear correction. Pride will not allow that. They cannot bear a brother who shouldn't have been there. Sister shouldn't have been there. This is not your office. This is not your right. My brother, you shouldn't be controlling our coordinator. This is his area. This is the group coordinator. This is his responsibility. How is it that you are usurping his authority and position? And now you are the one controlling, controlling the district. That's not your position. They become angry. Why are they talking to me like that? My position is so important. I must control everything, whether I am coordinator or not, group coordinator or not. That's just title. That's just charge. I gave them that. I know my value. I know what I should have been. I am the one that chose this position for myself. It's, I could have been a coordinator. I could have been an overseer. Hey, you're playing with church mates. This is the house of God. And the judgment comes in various ways. You cannot predict how the judgment will come. And Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth, while he was angry with the priest, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord. And from beside the incense altar, and Nazariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him and behold he was leprous in his forehead and they thrust him out from thence yea he himself hasted also to go out because the Lord had not what 
smiting him, it was a smiting of the Lord. You know, Azariah, he, he even could not smite him. How could Azariah do that? And all the priests, they were powerless. They just came to him and said, Our king, you shouldn't be doing this. They couldn't discipline the man. And God smote him. You know something? It is some people that carry themselves in such a way. And they say, touch me if you can. Coordinator, touch me if you can. Group coordinator, touch me if you can. Region of Asia, discipline me if you can. State of Asia, try it. And let's see, let's scatter the church on your head. Hey, the state of Asia may not be able to touch you. There is a hand in heaven. And God smote him. You want to miss heaven because of this little thing? You want to miss the glory of eternity because of this little thing? Get on your knees and humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And do not allow the anger and the wrath of God to smite you to the ground. And then for you to die under that judgment of God. God hates pride. And he deals with it in a very serious way. Look at verse 21. And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death. The Discipline upon him continued until the day of his death. Where then will he be spending eternity now? Think about that. Somebody who, who died under the wrath and the anger and the judgment of God. And the divine discipline was not reversed, was not lifted until he died because of pride. Because of pride. The punishment and the perdition of the proud. We're looking at Numbers Numbers chapter 16. In Numbers chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 8. Numbers chapter 16, verse 8. Here we find pride in manifestation. And let's see what, what the pride did to them. In Numbers chapter 16, we're looking at verse 8. And Moses said unto Korah, Hear, I pray you, ye sons of Levi, Seemeth it a small sin unto you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and all your people following after you. Oh, don't you think, shouldn't you be grateful to God? God has raised you up and has brought you near to serve in the tabernacle. In verse 10, and he has brought thee, he has brought thee near to him. And all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, was thee. And seek ye the priesthood also. The one you've got, you didn't campaign for that. The one you've got, you didn't, nobody voted you in for that. This is just the free grace of God and the provision of God. If you have got this step and this one without any campaign and without any maneuvering and without any, any political trick, if you got it just simple like this, why don't you just rest in the Lord and let the Lord do whatever he wants to do. If he wants to give you anything higher, why why do we have to now use this corny method, crafty method, political method, so that we can have what the Lord has not given us and seek ye the priesthood also? In verse 11, for which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord, and what is Aaron, and that ye murmur against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and which said, We will not come up. Moses, stay where you are. Limit yourself. And don't ever send any message to me that I shall come. You have your place, I have my place. Your position, I have my position. We will not come. You see that kind of pride? And who did God use to deliver all these children of Israel out of Egypt? Moses. Who did God use to bring the law on those two tables of stone to the children of Israel? Moses. Who did God use to establish the priesthood? Moses. Who did God use to bring all the Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, all the priests, and then give them all their various responsibilities? God used Moses. And Moses said, now, 
Can you call? Let's settle this problem. Let's talk about this is terrible. This should not be taking place in the midst of the children of God. Let's talk about this. And he said, go back and tell him we will not come. Is it a small sin in verse 13 that thou hast brought us up out of a land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness except thou make thyself all together a prince over us? Think about that. They were accusing Moses now. You're making yourself a prince over us. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Can I correct the mistake you're making? When God called Moses, Moses said, No, I'm a stammerer. I cannot do it. Choose another person. He didn't make himself a prince over them. But that's what he said in their pride. Moreover, thou hast brought unto us, not brought us into the land that flowed with milk and honey, and gi- or given us inheritance of the fields and the vineyards. Will thou put out the eyes of these men? Will, we will not come up. That, that was a serious sin. Uh, you see, the manifestation of pride, it begins in the heart. We're looking at verse 28. We're talking about the punishment and the perdition of the proud. The people come so proud, so pompous, they regard nobody. They will not answer anybody. They are there and there is nobody compared with them. And Moses could not touch them. Moses could not do anything because they, we don't even accept your authority, your leadership. You're making yourself a prince over us. The Lord has not put you there. We want to tell you that we don't accept your leadership. And it's all pride. What's the result of that? Verse 28. And Moses said, Hereby shall you know that the Lord has sent me. Hereby shall you know. I didn't put myself here. Hereby shall you know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, a strange punishment, and they hath opened a mouth and swallowed them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into to the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words that the ground clave asunder that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all his goods. And they and all that appertained unto them went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. I pray God will deliver us from the consequence of pride. That we will remain in the Lord and remain depending upon the Lord and serving the Lord. And will not allow the judgment that comes upon the proud to come upon us in Jesus' name. Nebuchadnezzar, the proud king, was abased and humbled before God. He himself later confessed and said, And those that walk in pride is able to abase the humiliation of so great an emperor in the sight of the whole world. Both the Jews whom he had brought low and of the Babylonians who were in Trying to make an idol of him. That humiliation was in itself a great example of God's power and authority over men, over all men. It's a powerful reminder that God is the judge of all men. The punishment should awaken us and make us conscious of the hatefulness of the sin of pride. Any soul defiled by the sin of pride, arrogance, and self-seeking must expect the heavy hand of divine judgment to fall upon him. He who walks in pride or sets himself up, his own will up, his own pleasure above the will and above the pleasure of God will eventually be abased and humiliated in the sight of men in the sight of angels too the word of God tells us that the lofty the independent spirit of self important man who will not for one moment allow that all he is and all he has and all he can do belongs to God that lofty haughty spirit will be severely rebuked by God God has said it and what he has said he will surely accomplish pride is infinitely hateful 
people unto God. There is in pride that which insults God, that which rejects God, and that which dethrones God. Pride is destructive to the soul, for no proud or subdued spirit can ever see God. And let's look at Psalm 101, Psalm 101. See God's attitude, God's judgment of pride. Psalm 101, I'm reading from verse 5. Psalm 101, verse 5. Whoso privilege slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that has a high look and a proud heart, I will not suffer, I will not allow, I will not permit in my presence. Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 21. Psalm 119, verse 21 says, Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed. The curse of the Lord is upon the proud, which do err from thy commandment. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 16. We're looking at verse 5. You see how God deals with the proud. In Proverbs 16, verse 5, everyone, how many people? Tell me out loud. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. His punishment, his judgment is sure and certain. Isaiah chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 12. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, he shall be brought low. Every one lifted up shall be brought low. Isaiah chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 11. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 11. I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Isaiah chapter 23, verse 9. Isaiah 23 verse 9, the Lord of hosts has purposed, has purposed it to stain the pride of all glory and to bring into contempt all the honorable men of the earth. You see then the judgment of the Lord, Malachi chapter 4 verse 1. Malachi chapter 4 verse 1, all over, all through the Bible we find the judgment of God coming upon the people that are proud. Malachi chapter 4 verse 1. For behold the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubborn. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall not leave them, it shall, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. We see Sephaniah chapter 3. Sephaniah chapter 3. In Sephaniah chapter 3, we're looking at it from verse 11. Chapter 3 of Sephaniah, verse 11. In that day, shall thou, eh, shall thou not be ashamed for all thy doings wherein thou hast transgressed against me? For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride. Them that rejoice in pride, they celebrate pride. It says, I'll take them away. And thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. I will also live in the midst of thee and afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. When they see that the proud people, God deals with them, and they're still poor, they say, well, if we're going to have any change in our situation, we need to call upon the name of the Lord. And the remnant of Israel, verse 13, shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13. The judgment of God coming upon those who are proud. The judgment of God that will be terrible. And that's why the Lord is saying, as you look at yourself and you see yourself in the mirror of the word of God, repent, turn away, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, that he may bring his glory and his forgiveness upon your life. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 15. It says, hear ye, and give ear, be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. 
see the judgment coming upon the proud and it says hear and give ear be not proud for the lord has spoken give glory to the lord your god before he caused darkness and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains and while you look for light he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness but if you will not hear it my soul shall weep for you my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride and mine eyes shall weep some and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. It's saying that captive, captivity will come if you will not repent and turn. It says, then I'll be weeping for you in secret because I know God will definitely judge the proud. We come to point number three, the purging and the preservation from pride. Purging. And preservation from pride. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Eventually the Lord purged the man. That he is the monarch. That he is Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord purged him. And cleansed him from that pride. He realized it eventually. I'm reading from verse 34. Daniel chapter 4 verse 34. And at the end of the days. I Nebuchadnezzar lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. And mine understanding returned unto me. And I bless the Most High, and I praise and honor Him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And He doeth according to His will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, none can stay His hand or say unto Him, What? Doest thou. At the same time, my reason returned unto me. And the, for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and my, my and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my Lord sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom. Ex, an excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. Let's read uh, together the rest of the sentence. And those that walk in pride... He is able to abase. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. There was a radical change of heart, life in the king. He had been cleansed and purged from his sin of pride. The gifts and the goodness of God had not led him to repentance, but the judgment, the rod, the indignation, the heavy hand, the rod of judgment, the divine discipline that came upon him had humbled him and turned him to the righteousness of God. And that's what we're told in Isaiah chapter 26. Look at this in your Bible. Mark it in your Bible. Isaiah chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 9. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 9. It says, With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, my, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let favor be showed to the wicked. Yet will he not learn righteousness in the land of the upright, in the land of uprightness? Will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord? There was a clear recognition of the great sin of his previous life, which he himself called walking in pride. Now he confessed to, the being, uh, to his being humbled, seeing himself with all the inhabitants of the earth as reputed as nothing. At last he was emptied of self. At last he was full of praises unto God. At last the God of heaven became so important and exalted before him. After his experience of transformation, there was a clear experience and evidence of humility. In his royal proclamation, he magnified God in his humiliation and his, in his restoration, concealing nothing and excusing nothing of God's rebuke and, of, and dealings with him. After his cleansing and transformation, he had more honor than he had 
before, yet she was not proud of it. And as she was before, he who never looked up to heaven in the former days of his pride, now looked up to heaven, seeing nothing on earth, and no one on earth to be proud of. And that's why you need to pray, purge me with Esau, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And the word of God says in First John chapter 1 verse 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Without this cleansing, without this purging, we shall remain in our defilement, dirty and defiled. We cannot live in the holy presence of God in heaven forever. No one who is covered with the defilement of pride will sit with Christ on his royal throne, on his royal heavenly throne. The Lord has the power to forgive. The Lord has the power to save. And the Lord has the power to cleanse, praying sincerely with unwavering faith and absolute confidence confidence in God's power and promise we can be purged and then we can be kept pure, clean, ready for heaven. And let's look at the word of God. It, it tells us in Psalm 51, Psalm 51, this is the prayer that David prayed and it's recorded for us so that we too will know when you have been defiled with the pride of life. You've been, de you've been defiled with the sin of arrogance and haughtiness. You can come to the Lord and pray and say, Lord, wash me and purge me. Make me whiter than snow. In Psalm 51, I'm reading from verse 7, purge me with Esau and I shall be clean. Wash me. And I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my transgressions. All my iniquities create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. A right spirit, humble spirit, lowly spirit. That you cleanse and purge away all the pride of the heart that shows the depravity of man or the fallen man and shows the depravity of the reprobate that you tell the Lord, Lord, wash me, cleanse me, purge me, purify me, take all this pride away from me. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. To serve the living God. We need to be purged and cleansed and washed. All the pride taken away. Well, the defilement of sin taken away before we can worship God acceptably. Verse 22. That is Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. And almost all things are by the Lord purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. Without the shedding of the blood of Jesus, we couldn't have had that remission. We're looking at Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two. For you to be useful in the hand of God, and for God to pour His Spirit upon your life and make you extraordinarily useful, profitable in the kingdom of God, we must be purged and purified from pride and every other sin. In Second Timothy chapter two, verse. 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God and the sure, having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. For in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but of wood and of earth, and some to honor, some to dishonor. Verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself, You've discovered yourself. You've discovered the dirt or the defilement of sin. And you've discovered the dirt and defilement of pride. And you want to be useful in the household of faith. You also want to get to heaven. You want the Lord to accept you into his presence now and in eternity. It says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. And then when temptation to pride comes, what do you do? Flee. Also youthful laws, but follow righteousness and faith and charity and peace with all them that call on the Lord with a pure heart. I was looking at um, Romans chapter 12, verses 3 and verse six, um, 16. Romans chapter 12. We're reading from verse 3. 
For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that's among you, not to think, it's on the heart, you remember, not to think, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Verse 16, be of the same mind one to another. And then it says, mind not high things in the house of God, in the household of faith, be satisfied with where God has put you and limit yourself to the responsibility you have been assigned. Don't aspire to a great ambition. I want to be this, I want to be that. To be in control of your leader in your district, in your group, in your state, in your region. Stay where God has put you. And it says, mind not high things. Condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. It tells us in James chapter 4. James chapter 4. I'm reading to you from verse 6. James chapter 4. We're looking at verse 6. But he giveth more grace. I pray he'll give you more grace. It may good, good. Amen. Amen. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud. If you are proud, God will resist you. Pride in your heart, God will resist you. Every time you want to make progress, you want to get something done, something will happen. God will put a barricade there, a wall of partition, a barrier there. He will resist you. If you have pride, because God hates pride in anyone, anytime, any generation. It says over here, wherefore he says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. We're looking at First Peter chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 5. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise ye younger Submit yourselves unto the elder. Younger in age, submit yourself unto the elder. Younger in spiritual responsibility. Submit yourselves unto the elder. Now, if you are disobeying the Bible, if you are disobeying this, the grace of God will not be multiplied in your life. The Lord will resist you. It says, ye, all of you, be subject one to another and be closed with what? With humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Verse 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that she may exalt you in due season. Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife of inglory. Nothing. However small, however minute, however temporary, however long, whatever it is, however spiritual, however mechanical, let nothing be done through strife of being glory, but in lowliness of mind that teaches him other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of his servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. The Lord wants us to manifest that humility. I'm going to show you two examples before we pray. In Second Chronicles chapter 32. Second Chronicles chapter 32. A man who was perfect, a man who was righteous, a man who was righteous in the sight of the Lord. And later, pride came in. Maybe you are saved. Maybe you are born again. And you profess to be saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, profitable in the kingdom of God. Remain in that humility and remain in that holiness and meekness. 
Because if you not go back and then you become proud and say, I know my record. I've been perfect. I've been righteous. I've been pure. I've been useful. I've been profitable. And now you descend low into the valley of pride. The chastisement of God was still come. We're looking at Second Chronicles chapter 32 verse 24. Second Chronicles chapter 22 verse 24. And in those days, Ezekiah was sick unto death. And he prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him, and he gave him a sign. The Lord healed Ezekiah. But now look at verse 25. But Ezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him. For his heart was lifted up, therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. He was a humble man. He was a meek man. He was a perfect, he was a righteous man. And when Isaac said, set your house in order, because you will die, you will not leave. He turned his face to the wall. He said, oh Lord, remember. I have walked perfectly before you. And the Lord said, Isaiah, look at that man. I accept what he has said. He has been righteous and perfect before me. Tell him, healing will come. I add 15 years to his life. Within those 15 years that were added to his life, it says in verse 25, But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him. For his heart was lifted up. Therefore, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. We're looking at chapter 34, Second Chronicles chapter 34. I'm reading from verse 26. And as for the king of Judah, this Josiah now, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so shall you say unto him, thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, and humbled thyself before me, and didst rain thy clothes and weep before me, and I have even heard thee also, says the Lord, Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt, ga shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place, upon the inhabitants of the same. So they brought the king word again. This one was humble. He had the word of God. He humbled himself. In the case of Hezekiah, who had been a righteous, pure, perfect king, a beloved king, an appreciated king, because of the pride of his heart, the Lord said, this backsliding. And it was very near the time of his death. And God said, wrath is going to come upon you and upon Judah and Jerusalem. In the case of Josiah, the Lord testified unto his humility when he heard the word of God. You make your choice tonight. Which one will you choose? Where will you be? And what will be your attitude? Will you be like Hosea that will reject the word of God and say, No, I don't want to hear that. And then if you're like that, you'll perish in your pride. But if you come and humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, the Lord says he'll have mercy upon you because he looks upon the humble and then he exalts them. We're going to rise up. We're going to pray to the Lord. And the Lord himself who has spoken to us today will help us to escape. The judgment that came upon Nebuchadnezzar and upon the many people in the Bible that were proud. You stand up and check up your life and check up your heart and see what has happened there. And see where you have been and what you have been doing. And see what the Lord is saying. Don't push the word to other people. Here is the word of God unto you. Say, oh Lord, here I am. Let the word of God extray your life. And then you tell the Lord now, oh Lord, here is where I stand. I'm sorry for anything of pride in my past life. And you humble yourself in such your Lord, and the Lord says, He'll forgive you. Open your mouth and pray. Have a right attitude as you hear the word of God. Accept the word of God. Hold on to this word and say, Lord, here am I. I surrender myself before you. Nobody is so great that the Lord does not look at his life. His heart, 
his disposition, his attitude, his reaction, his response to the spoken word, the reaching word, inspired word. The Lord says, in thine heart, what's in your heart? Pride, arrogance, a lifting up of self, and through his self, concentration of self, adoration, admiration of self. Why don't you tell the Lord, I'm sorry for that. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. Call ye upon the Lord while he's near. Seek him while he's near. While he can be found. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord in all humility and submission. And the Lord will have mercy upon him. Everyone who exalts himself, the Lord will abase. But he who humbles himself, the Lord will exalt. Pride is a deadly sin. Pride is a terrible sin. Repent of it. Be humbled before the Lord. You are man, he is God. You are a creature, he is creator. You are a child, earthly, he is father, heavenly, everlasting, eternal. To this man will I look. The one that has a contrite heart and trembles at my word. Forgiveness comes only after repentance. The transformation of Nebuchadnezzar was evident, visible. The most trouble people around him could see. And he wrote about it and sent it to all people. And now we're learning about it. We're learning from it today. Don't let the word of God come to you in vain. Samuel did not allow the word of God to fall to the ground. It had a place in his heart. It had transformation, effect, in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. Unfortunately for Belshazzar, he knew all this. He learned about all this. He saw it all. But he learned nothing. Until the judgment of God came from heaven. And that hand appeared that wrote his verdict, his sentence, his judgment upon the wall. Then did fear, consternation come upon him. And his knees began to knock together until the judgment came, the interpretation came. The kingdom is divided. A way that found wanting. The Lord has finished everything about you. Do not wait until that hour. Be purged, be cleansed, be washed, be purified from the sin of pride. Pride of possession. 
pride of achievement, pride of position, pride of beauty, a pride of what you have. The where don't harden your heart in pride. Bend low before the Almighty God and say, Lord, have mercy on me. He'll have mercy on you. God resists the proud. But he gives grace, more grace unto the humble. Be not ye mere hearers of the word. Be doers of the word. Give God a chance to work in your heart. God is God, is creator. Is the Almighty, is the ancient of days, is the one in whose hand your breath is. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, that He may lift you up in due time. Be purged. From the pride of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. The pride of Absalom. The pride of Nebuchadnezzar. The pride of Lucifer. And say, God, I bend low before you. The sight of the Lord. Then ask for grace. That what God has done, the purging, the purifying, the cleansing, pray that you would be permanent. Pray that you'll not be falling and rising, falling into pride, rising from pride, falling back into pride, rising from pride. Pray that God will give you a permanent experience of humility, of lowliness, of meekness before the Lord. That pride in its very nature will be totally crushed permanently out of your life, out of your heart. In your thought, in your language, in your appearance, in your disposition, in your attitude everywhere, in all your actions. That God himself will be able to be a witness of your humility. As he did for Moses. He said, Moses, my summons is not so. It's meek beyond all the people on the earth. Submit and surrender to the word of the Lord. Seek only his glory, not your glory. Seek only his honor, not your own honor. Seek only his exaltation and not your own exaltation. God says, I'll not share my glory with any man. Let the Lord do a permanent work like he did in Nebuchadnezzar. After God has done this, he never went back into that pride again. He said, now all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing before him. He realized that that became a permanent experience of his life. And he always remembered. He remembered every day. When the temptation came to be proud again, he said, no. Those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. He reminded himself of that every day. That kept him humble. Remind yourself of the word of God every day. When the temptation comes to be proud. When the temptation comes to be haughty. When the temptation comes to resist. 
the word, the will, the revelation of God in your life. Remind yourself, they that walk in pride, he the almighty God, the ancient of days, the most high, he is able to abase. And let the fear of God control your life, your lifestyle, your character, your conduct. So that humility becomes the visible thing that people see. You are closed with humility. If you pray, he will answer. Purge me with Isop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. 